The first land that I would say Iowa is 145 acres. It's about 25 acres of timber. The rest of it was just bare GMO soybean fields, bare soil. And we started from scratch, no infrastructure, no well, no power, no house, no barn, no high tunnel, no nothing. Let it be known, I mean, we're super early stage here. We're you know, less than three years in this particular site. We brought in a lot of propagated stock from elsewhere you know, beforehand, but very early stage. on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, whatever. So if you want to see this polycultural, permaculture stuff happening on the web with images, not just from my site, but elsewhere, you can search that oftentimes and see a lot more stuff. Um, this is what we're shooting for. Um, this talk is about farm scale permaculture. So it's about permacultural systems that are scaled up to be food producing for lots and lots of people. Uh, replicate of a lot of our farms. So what you're seeing here is a, a linear or a curvilinear guild system. So you're seeing multiple species of plants that are planted together, but it's done via replicate, so it's repeating. So silvopasture, this is the most simplistic definition of silvopasture you can see. This is in Georgia, this is loblaw and pine, grass and cattle, right? So that's trees and pasture, that's the definition of silvopasture. But silvopasture can be a lot, a lot more than that, and that's what we're trying to implement. Um, civil pasture for human beings. If, you're, if you have a civil pasture that's incorporating both a tree element and a livestock element, are you managing that just for the livestock or are you managing that for human yields? Right? You can choose between those two. Or you can just focus on the livestock, right? Now, with that, if you're choosing between a civil pasture focusing on livestock or civil pasture for humans, your energy flows are totally different, right? It's way more intense for human consumption than it is just for livestock, right? But if you put that intensity on the highest value, okay, I want to have apple trees in my civil pasture, and I want to pick all the food that I can for dessert fruit for human consumption, $4 a pound certified organic, then your waste products and your drops are that livestock element. So you're still utilizing the full resource base, but you're focusing on that front side element, right? If you're two people into your 60s or 70s, maybe you have less of an energy input that you can give and you want to focus more on the livestock, right? But it's just a continuum and you manage accordingly. So we're focusing on this on the front side and if we decide not to wake up for six months, this is what will happen in the long term. So a very brief uh, explanation of key line is that you see the black lines on there? Those are topographic elevations. Uh, the red lines are a way to essentially capture water on the contour and it ideally migrate it towards the ridges at about a 1% slope around the hill and then sink it in the ground. The whole entire key line layout in about six hours, two of the hours was the tractor sitting still doing nothing. So it took about four hours to do 40 acres. Um, so if you hire myself or anybody else to go lay out a key line arrangement on your field with old school laser levels and flags, there's no way you can do 40 acres in that kind of time, much less install it, lay it out. It's just insane how fast it goes in. Um, again, accurate within one centimeter from space, completely re repeatable. There's a rear view, obnoxious horsepower reviews. Uh, cost me $500 a day flat to run the tractor, $50 an engine hour beyond that, blah, blah, blah. Um, cost $30 an acre to put it in. So here's the, I went back into those rips with my 1960 Oliver. <laughs> You see how the, that was the wheel patterns into a bare alfalfa field? And then we followed the rip with this old school tractor, planting trees into it with a pretty ironclad tree transplanter. You know, these are all propagated 24 inch tall whips. I'll talk about how cheap you can put in a silver pasture, too. So a year before this, this was GMO soybeans. The next year it was alfalfa. And now it's just crazy polyculture of trees and stuff. Um, this is how it looked a year ago. So tree shelters and everything, raising livestock in the alleyways. And it was done. Whole thing, 65 bucks an acre. 
livestock are not confinement livestock. They're the opposite of that, right? Um, Peter Allen is a friend of mine. He's doing really cool stuff in the Driftless, Southwest Wisconsin area. If you look at his herd cattle versus anybody else's that's backgrounding for the feedlot, they're totally different animals. One advantage is, is that a lot of the, the permaculture livestock that are better adapted to less management and less infrastructure are really cheap. So they're really you know, adapted to live outside with no structure. You know, they're not going to get burned by the sun. They don't need to be saying hello to every day. Um, and they root naturally and raise naturally. Um, the Kuni Kuni Asabak Cross gives us reasonably short snouted animals that graze grass and clover. So they're less prone to root, so they're not you know, automatically seeking to destroy your fields, um, which is pretty cool. So they're unringed. There's no physical human intervention of putting a metal hook through someone's nose so they don't uh, you know, express their natural behavior. So that's cool. So we're not feeding any grain. They do get compost treats every now and then. That includes some bread when it's at the co-op free. But they can survive year-round on pasture. They're leaving one paddock and going to the next. They're gonna have a little bit of disturbance, you know, bare soil. If you can seed, seed on top of that, and then with pigs, you don't wanna have them back in the same spot for 45 days to break that cycle of, of pests and stuff. It takes about 45, 60 days to get a turnip, you know, to reasonable size, maybe a little longer. So you can revisit that, and then they've got that root crop right there too. Um, do we do that nearly enough? No, but we should. Are, are they in the fields with your tree sap? Right now they're they're off the side, but they're usually they're, they're in the alleyways. Yeah, and they don't touch your trees. Electric fence. Oh, they're trained to it. Yep. Uh, Premier one quick fence, about 30 inches tall. The tillage and the, and the labor it takes to produce grain, even for small scale livestock production, is is not sustainable in a permaculture context, in my opinion. So you need to be able to select species and breeds that can thrive on forage, not purchased or hauled in anything, right? Mm -hmm. So here's the Atlantic chicken. It's bred to be presumably cold weather hardy, but it's still looking for grain, you know? So what do you do to get around that? I'm a believer in, you know, what, what's in your biome, what's around you right now? Are turkeys hanging out? Are geese hanging out? Yeah, you know, they're making it go. And they actually eat grass. They don't need to have grain purchased from the co-op and cracked and hauled in and fed to them every day. So I have to actually look at what's the highest net revenue I can do like per crop, right? Mm -hmm. So hay was great, but now hay prices have taken a dive and hay sucks, right? So you know, what do you have to do in the meantime to make, to make the note? Um, and the long-term plan with, with tree crops is that, you know, obviously you want to utilize the highest level of value chain you can. So human consumption, right? So chestnuts, retail $6 a pound, wholesale $3 a pound. You know, if you had to dry them and turn them into chestnut flour, that is not a very good utilization of that crop, right? So you're best off marketing that as fast as you can, right? Um, so there's a continuum of that. We talked about layers, stuff like that. That's a knob russet apple. That's pretty ugly. Here we've got a sprayed red delicious. So it's a high input fruit. It's a commodity market, right? A knob russet is pretty rare. That's three, four dollars a piece, right? Um, we've got a few uh, russets grafted, but my intention with the farm is we want to have as many grafted varieties of heirloom russets or naturally disease resistant fruit so we can market them as certified organic dessert fruit. And if they get a little far gone or they get a little beat up, then they become certified organic cider. Um, and then ideally that's direct marketed as well. So, so if you had to buy apple root stock at say $3 a stick for a small quantity, and you bought in sign wood at a dollar, for four dollars you've got a fifty dollar tree in, in two years time, right? Um, if you've got a big tree like a lot of these beauties out here and you want to sell it to this growing permaculture movement, oftentimes you can sell cyan wood as a yield in the winter time at three dollars a lineal foot and get higher gross revenue from cyan wood sales than you can from fruit sales in the fall. So, and again, like I used to sell heirloom garlic, um, and most of the sales are to commercial growers, and they're never going to buy from you again because they already have their garlic, and they're going to make more. Um, and there's always this fear and the scarcity complex of, oh, if I sell that to someone, I lose it forever. Well, this is kind of a growing movement, and there's a lot of demand out there, so I'm not concerned about proliferation. So direct marketing, and you just do talks like this, and that's how people hear about you 
kind of you know, I didn't do a single talk at all okay. until like a year ago on this stuff. Okay. Um, it's just Facebook, really. You put put photos on the internet of stuff that you're doing, and people buy it. This was a dead bare soil field, right? So 2,4-D in glyphosate means nothing grows. So I'll walk through a very specific timeline here so you can understand it. In April of 2013, it was bare, dead soil that had just been plowed up, right? Planted oats alfalfa mix. So that was a alfalfa red clover forage mix with about 10% grasses, orchard grass and timothy, right? So there's no grass pressure at this point in time, okay? Um, oats came up as a nurse crop, harvested the oats, sold the oats as uh, cover crop seed. So immediate revenue year one. Um, gave time for the hay to come on. The next year came in and planted these trees directly into this newly established alfalfa field, right? Um, immediately cut the adjacent hay next to that and then raked it on to, the, to that hay to suppress it. So there's no tillage, there's nothing laying out, it's just cutting a slit, dropping trees in, in a, a hay field and laying the extra forage to suppress the neighboring stuff. At best, 10% grass, very little grass pressure. If you went into a, a regular bluegrass lawn and did this, you'd have a lot of grass pressure, right? So you'd have to mulch it or mow the crap out of it. Um, we just use the existing hay to mulch it. This is a tangent, but it's a worthy tangent. So every apple tree that, that you eat in the store is a grafted apple tree. So that means it's, it's clonally propagated, so they're identical. So if a new pest comes along and you've got 10 red delicious and 10 yellow delicious, they're all, they're all dead. If you plant out trees of selected varieties, there are statistically likely to be good fruit, meaning not spitters. There's gonna be a little bit of variability there, but in all likelihood it will be a good edible tree and you're gonna have this natural genetic diversity, right? So all of the academics will tell you, you need to have 10 Fujis and 10 Yellow Delicious and 10 Granny Smiths and that's how you have a diverse orchard. And I believe that you should have two Knob Russet, two Golden Russet, two Wine Sap and you know, a lot more diversity. But furthermore, you need to be planting out seeds from those fruit that have you know, cross-pollinated and growing those trees out so you have that, that diversity over time. So with our nursery, essentially sell no grafted trees whatsoever. What we do is we grow trees out from selected varieties. So like pawpaws and chestnuts, we collect seed from trial orchards of grafted varieties. So there's a couple different pawpaw orchards around the country that have all these like 10 or 15 all the Peterson pawpaws and all these selected varieties. The fruit from that, genetically speaking, statistically speaking, are gonna produce really good fruit. So those seeds are grown out of seedlings and those are the trees that we sell. So if you get 100 trees from me, they're all genetically unique but they're all pretty damn good. Um, so you never know what you're gonna get, but it's gonna be from selected stock, which I think is advantageous.